In this video lecture, we're going to learn about the clinical neuroscience of substance use disorders. This video lecture has some important information about neuroplasticity, which we'll spend a little bit more time understanding. We'll learn about tonic versus phasic firing, the role of gene transcription in addiction processes. We'll learn about salience and its role in addiction, the mesocortical dopamine pathway and the role of dopamine in addiction, We'll learn about behavioral conditioning models for addiction, and that'll play into our understanding of tolerance and withdrawal. Then we'll learn about medication seeking and the role of medication assisted treatment. Here's some information that we're going to cover on the neuroscience of addiction. We're going to first learn about why it is that a person develops tolerance to a drug over time. We'll learn about uh, experiments that have been run with monkeys to understand, for example, when you give multiple doses, the same amount, there's multiple doses of cocaine over time, um, what happens in terms of dopamine response. This is important to understand because the, basically what happens over time is that they're, the person becomes sensitized, uh, or I should say the animal in this occasion, to uh, to the drug and so less of the neurochemical is released and that's the process by which tolerance develops. We'll also learn about long-term sensitization and look at what's happening in, again in monkey brains when you give a monkey cocaine over time and the interesting thing is that uh, which is kind of runs contrary to what you might think the same dose produces progressively higher levels of dopamine than in earlier weeks of administration. So in other words, you don't need to take more of the drug to have the same dopamine effect. And the, the reason for this is because the receptors uh, become sensitized and, and you develop more receptors and there's more reception of dopamine. And so dopamine is received more and more, even with the same dose. And so that's why you need to have more and more of the dose to achieve a, a, the kind of high, the kind of flooding effect, if you will. We'll learn about what happens in terms of uh, uh, dendritic spines with addiction processes and how they can often grow in terms of the the sheer just, I don't know, structure of, of the dendrite. We'll also look at the, the growth of receptors and what that means. We'll also try to understand the neuroplasticity of addiction and actually what happens in recovery. So in recovery, oftentimes, actually, the person is able to to make quite a functional recovery um, when they move into remission in, in, in some regards, just in terms of the neurotransmission kind of process. But we should also add that when a person relapses there, believe it or not, the, uh, their dendrites move very quickly back uh, to the way in which they were during active addiction. Then we'll learn about the mesocortical dopamine pathway. There are two particular areas that we'll pay a lot of attention to, which is the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, which are large producers of dopamine. And dopamine in and of itself is a very important neurotransmitter to understand with addiction because of its role in motivation. One of the things you're probably familiar with in addiction is that a person becomes less sensitive to ordinary everyday rewards um, when they are in an active addiction. So for example, when you're working with people who are in recovery or, or, or just starting to move into a recovery, they'll say things like, you know, I, I don't experience the same degree of pleasure with, from eating food or from doing, you know, typical things that would produce pleasure. And that's because their brain is sensitized to the amount of, uh, you know, for example, dopamine required uh, to, to experience pleasure. It's a much, much higher amount. So compared to that, uh, typical activities such as consumption of food are not going to emulate anywhere near the same amount of dopamine. And so they don't experience the same motivation to, for example, eat certain uh, foods. And that's why you tend to see in uh, animals such as rats, if, you're, if they're given the opportunity to either consume um, cocaine in a kind of saline solution or food, they'll go with cocaine and and they'll uh, get to the degree where they're you know quite emaciated and and uh, and, and unwell.
it's important to mention that uh, while socially we have certain categories for drugs and medications such as you know prescribed uh, acceptable versus illegal uh, non-acceptable in, in mainstream society that we should really understand drugs by the mechanism of which they work and a good example of that is stimulants you should know that prescription stimulants such as methyl methylphenidate ritalin uh, or amphetamine which is adderall those medications have a very similar mechanism of action to cocaine and interestingly enough if you look at the way in which the brain lights up with the methylphenidate and cocaine it's very similar They're, they both work in, in kind of a similar way um, in terms of dopamine now why this is important for you to understand is that um, uh, the di major difference though is that cocaine cannot be regulated and controlled in the same way as a prescribed medication can and so in other words if you were able to put cocaine into a pill form and give it to someone you know in the same amount every day there would be other issues that would come out of cocaine don't believe me uh, cocaine is a very addictive drug but but in terms of uh, the benefits that you would get it would be quite similar to something like methylphenidate in terms of, for example, attention and ability to attend. Okay, so we're going to round out today's learning with uh, uh, kind of reviewing medication assisted treatment. And that's important because when you're working with addiction, particularly more intensive uh, long-term use of a substance, oftentimes you're going to be uh, uh, using or, or know of clients that will be using medication to assist them in recovery. So we'll learn about some of these medications and their basically the neuroscience of them, why they work, such as well, antabuse, camprosate, naltrexone. Antabuse, for example, has uh, creates unpleasant effects when drinking, so it makes drinking as a kind of aversive experience for the drinker. It also will block withdrawal, which is very helpful for someone who's going to face be facing acute withdrawal symptoms. A camprosate, similarly to antabuse, has unpleasant effects. Uh, for example, it, it makes a person vomit extensively. Um, and then naltrexone. Naltrexone has null effects. So in other words, you don't experience the euphoria from drinking. Um, and naltrexone, also known as Narcan, of course, has a major role in recovery from opioids. And we'll be talking about naltrexone in just a moment. We'll learn about uh, methadone, which reduces withdrawal effects and um, is a more controlled way of helping a person to manage cravings and, and uh, it's related to opioids, especially heroin. And we'll learn about buprenorphine, which suppresses and re again and reduces craving. Now, now trexone or Narcan is very interesting uh, to look at as a drug because while it's often seen as a kind of miracle drug because uh, if you administer Narcan to someone who is, uh, has overdosed on an opioid, something like heroin, it's able to block the effects so that the person doesn't experience you know, major CNS depression to the extent where they can't breathe, you know, that their breathing is majorly impacted. So it can actually help a person to kind of come out of a major overdose uh, without dying. And so for that reason, it's, it's today been given to people in community clinics with some degree of training um, to be just carried around in case they are in a situation where they find someone who's overdosed and is at risk of death. The problem with this is that some um, experts in public health will talk about risky shift phenomenon, which is this concern that if you uh, are in a community where naltrexone is readily available, and you're a drug user of say a heroin user you're more likely to use more because of the, the kind of mental game you play this kind of calculation that well if i do overdose then maybe someone with Nar narcan will basically be able to administer it and i won't die and so uh, i'm free to use more of the drug and there are actual studies that have found uh, a an effect for increased uh, overdoses and increased uh, amounts, uh, amounts of drug use in communities uh, that where Narcan is more uh, readily available. 
so there's it's complicated uh, unfortunately addiction treatment is very complicated and there are many factors to consider so we'll talk about that and about the risky shift phenomenon we'll also talk about some interesting uh, medications that can assist in in treatment such as chantix chantix of course is used for smoking cessation purposes now chantix is very interesting because not only does it block nicotine receptors but it also produces this moderate dopamine release, it stimulates dopamine release, not to the extent the nicotine does, but more so than if you were to just stop cold turkey. And so it pr produces two effects. Number one, blocks the craving for, of nicotine from the nicotinoid receptors. And the second is, uh, releases a small amount of dopamine, and that in and of itself can be useful for motivational purposes, uh, reward purposes. So uh, we'll talk about Chantix and, and its role, of course, uh, in uh, recovery from uh, tobacco uh, addiction and, and, and smoking cessation. And that'll round out our learning about neuroscience of addiction for this week. So I look forward to seeing you all in class and we'll spend some time uh, exploring these concepts together.